man. What's happening? Oh, hey, Doug. What's up? Uh, getting ready for Praise in the Park, studying Joey Chestnut's techniques. Who's Joey Chestnut? Who's Joey Chestnut? Yeah. He's only the number one hot dog eating champion in the world. 66 hot dogs in 12 minutes. And that includes buns. Mmm, good for Joey Chestnut. Yeah. What does that have to do with Praise in the Park? Well, I mean, I, I heard there's going to be a hot dog eating contest. Dude, there's no hot dog eating contest. There is praise music, though, by the DUMC Praise Band, a short message by you, and yeah, we're giving away free hot dogs, but there's no contest. Besides that, how do you think you're going to eat 66 hot dogs in 12 minutes? One bite at a time, Doug. One bite at a time. Good luck with that. That's what I did at work this week. Um, I hope that you will come out this Saturday, though. We are uh, really looking forward to Praise in the Park. Uh, Doug and his team have been putting together some awesome music to uh, just celebrate God's creation. We felt like May was a good time to be outside and to be in a park and to get, uh, get to do something a little different than we usually do for worship. And so uh, I hope that you will come. If you, uh, on your way out, the ushers will have one of these cards here. Um, what I would love is for every family to invite a family. Um, I think that that is, all of us here have neighbors, we have friends, we have coworkers, colleagues that, that we've been praying for, maybe hoping would, would join a church. And uh, this is just a, a nice, comfortable, casual way to come and, and have a worship service and to enjoy some food and fellowship together. So I hope that you'll take one of these cards and pass it along this week uh, and, and join us next Saturday at Brook, uh, Brook Run Park from 4 to 7. It's going to be great. Um, as you can tell, I'm not at my best this morning. Um, uh, I, I will make a deal with you, though. I will try hard not to sneeze right into the microphone if you'll promise not to laugh when my voice cracks at some point. So is that a, is that a deal? Okay. Let's, uh, let's pray together. God, open us up. <laughs> open, open airways for those who are having trouble breathing this morning. Open... Open eyes, God, so we can see your face. Open ears, God, so we can hear your voice. Open hearts so that we can feel your presence with us. And then, God, open hands so that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Uh, so a few weeks back, my wife Lindsay and I were having lunch with uh, a couple from DUMC, a couple from here. And... Um, my wife brought up one of the other husband's endearing qualities that kind of made all of us at the table laugh. She said, Lindsay said, no matter what it is I'm talking about, he will listen for a little bit and then inevitably he'll jump in and he'll say, now, what you need to do is, and he's always got a suggestion for what we need to do. And I think we all have, we all have people in our lives right, like that, right? People who um, who have an answer, or at the very least, a very strong suggestion for what to do in any situation. You know the kind of people I'm talking about? We all have these kind of folks in our lives. And, and in the case of our friend, it's a, it's a characteristic that, that makes us laugh because his, uh, his advice is always offered with, with humility and a sincere desire to be, to be helpful. But there are other people, right? There are other people whose um, generous instruction uh, is less well received. Am I correct? You know these kind of people as well. The people uh, who maybe, uh, rather than their advice, their, their counsel being a sign of their genuine concern, uh, it's more a sign of them just being an obnoxious know-it-all, right? Now, raise your hand if you know an obnoxious know-it-all. Raise your hand if they're sitting within a couple seats of you. Are they, are they here with you this morning? These are, these are the kind of people who regardless of the subject, it seems, want to make sure that everybody else in the room knows that they are much more informed than you are. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, and it can be kind of offensive, right? 
It can be especially offensive if one of these know-it-alls kind of wades into our own personal area of expertise and presumes to know more than we do. I'm thinking of, you know, doctors who are sitting with patients who have come in with an arm full of printouts from WebMD and say, now doc, what you need to do is, or, or financial advisors and accountants who are on the phone with clients who just finished reading a Dave Ramsey book and they say, now look, here's what we need to do. And it can be really aggravating, right? Um, our family, this kind of, I, I thought about this, this past week, our family, we, we just moved into Dunwoody this weekend, uh, which we're really excited about being part of the, the community. The only thing that the community gave us was a cold so far, but, um, <laughs> but we are excited to be in Dunwoody, and the new house that we have has a pool. And I don't know anything about pools, how to take care of pools, what to do with pools, and so I called a pool guy to come over and make sure that the pool was going to be ready for the summer. And uh, a couple weeks back, he arrived at the house a little bit before I did, and so by the the time I got there, he was already in the backyard, uh, and, and as I approached kind of from behind, I saw that he was standing there with his hands on his hips, scanning back and forth across this deep, dark green, leaf-cluttered, stagnant mess that he had been charged to whip into shape, and, and I know you're all now dying to come over for a swim, and you're all <laughs> invited to come really, really soon, um, and, and, and I, I, you know, imagine, imagine what what would have happened if, if I, the one who kind of was responsible for this mess and, and who so far hadn't done anything to fix it, if I had kind of saddled up next to the pool guy and haphazardly said, now, what you need to do is, I might have ended up at the bottom of that deep, dark green mess, right? Um, but in a way, this is exactly what Jesus does in our text this morning, isn't it? Um, as he walks down to the, to the seaside that morning, he finds Simon and, and Simon's associates, Simon's fishing partners, unloading their boats and rinsing out their nets after a long night of frustratingly unsuccessful fishing. And then this part-time carpenter, part-time preacher, walks up to these lifelong fishermen and says, now what you need to do is... And, you know... I don't think anybody would have blamed Simon and, and, and Simon's uh, associates if they had responded and said, look, Rabbi, uh, all due respect and everything, but this is literally none of your business. Um, we're tired. We're hungry. We're soaking wet. We are in no mood to take advice from someone who hasn't even spent a day out on the water. So why don't you just stick to what you know, go preach your little sermon, and leave us alone? And you got to kind of wonder about Jesus' timing here, right? I mean, did he pick the best time to, to tell these guys how to do their jobs a little bit better? I think a lot of times we wonder about God's timing. I think a lot of times we question, why is it that God seems to sometimes wait until we have fallen flat on our faces to show up and tell us what we need to do? Why didn't Jesus show up the evening before as they were loading the boats and getting ready to go out to do their work and point them in the right direction? Why did Jesus wait until their backs were aching and their stomachs were grumbling to tell them where the fish would be? Why does God wait until we are completely lost sometimes before God gives us guidance? Why does God wait until our lives seem to be at their most chaotic before God gives us some peace? Why does God seem to sometimes wait until we feel totally alone to assure us that we are loved and that we are known. You know, when I, when I made the decision to change vocational course after, after college and, and to pursue a, a career in full-time ministry instead of something else, I, I figured that God would <coughs> immediately honor my faithfulness with open doors and smooth paths, you know? Doesn't that make sense? And, and so I, I applied for a number of positions in, in several different churches, and, and I was sure that there would be an abundance of options for me and that I would be able to select, select the job that was going to suit me and my family best. But weeks went by, and all of those jobs went to other people. And pretty quickly, my, my road to ministerial success was being paved with nothing but failures and rejections, one after the other. And, and I found myself on my knees one day, screaming at God words that I won't 
repeat and hear because I was so angry, you know, that, that none of my um, completely devout and selfless motives and efforts um, to serve the Lord had, had, had left me with empty nets. And, and then it was a couple days later while I was sitting in church, tired and, and frustrated and defeated, that the scripture of the day was read from the Gospel of John, and it was the scene where Jesus is sitting with his disciples at the Last Supper, and, and Jesus says to them, you did not choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit. And it was almost as if Jesus had strolled up to my boat after a long night of fruitless fishing and had said, good, <laughs> good. Now that you have done everything on your own and you have followed your own wisdom and you have thought that you were in control of it all and come up empty, now you're ready. Now you're ready to go where I want you to go. And then the very next day, from out of the blue, a ministry position that I hadn't even applied for was offered to me. And it's not, it's not that I believe that God only speaks to us when we have reached our moment of failure. You know, I, 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 I don't think that that's how it works. But I do believe, I do believe that we are much more hard of hearing when we think we know what we're doing, when we think that we've got it under control, or when whatever it is we're doing seems to be going well. Imagine if Simon's crew had been unloading a record catch of fish the morning that Jesus walked down to the boats. Do you think they would have even paid attention when Jesus stepped into the boat? Would there have even been any room for Jesus in the boat in the first place? You know, if there's if there's one good thing about those moments, about those times that we fail, about those times when our boats and our nets are empty, it's that there is plenty of space for Jesus to come in and be among us. And so with nothing really else to do that morning, Simon decided that he would take Jesus out into the shallow water so that Jesus could teach the crowds. Now, isn't that interesting that the first thing Jesus does with Simon when he finds Simon at his point of failure is Jesus takes him to church, you know, just like Jesus took me to church. And you know these folks, right, who whatever it is is going on in your life, whatever it is you're complaining about or struggling with or, or not seeming to be able to overcome, their, their response is always the same. You know what you need to do? You need to go to church. And I was at the grocery store just last week, and, and the, the customer who was in line in front of me was giving the cashier an earful about some coupon that wasn't ringing up correctly, and it was probably a dispute about like 75 cents or something, but it was clearly the most uh, injustice that this person had ever experienced in their life. And, and once that ordeal was done and she moved along, I came up to the register, and I, I smiled at the cashier, and I, I said, well, I guess she forgot to take her medicine today or something equally pastoral. It was not a good moment for me, but, um, <laughs> but the cashier, she just went about her work and she smiled and she goes, oh, that's nothing that medicine can fix. <laughs> she said, that lady just needs a big dose of Jesus. And Simon needed a big dose of Jesus, right? Simon needed a big dose of Jesus that morning, and so Jesus took him to church. And Jesus made him sit right next to the preacher. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if Jesus' sermon that morning hadn't had something to do with God's grace being sufficient or about, about how God is strong when we are weak or about how if God provides even for the birds of the air, how much more is God going to provide for those who love and follow him. And it's not so much that, that, that the church, just going to church is the answer, that the church even has the answers. I mean, there is nothing uh, about this space that makes it any more sacred than anywhere else in the world. I believe God is present anywhere and everywhere, but there is, there's something about going to church that, that opens us up to a greater awareness of God's presence in our life. There's something about the intentionality of our heart 
and of our mind coming to this place that allows us to hear a word from the Lord that we might not have been listening for if we had been somewhere else. Because I believe that if, that if we come to God with open ears and with open hearts, that most of the time God does, in fact, speak to us. And God might speak to us through, through the scripture reading. God might speak to us through the prayers or through the music or through the sermon. Sometimes, sometimes God has a word, delivers a message to us that nobody else in the room could have even heard that day because it was being spoken by the voice of the Holy Spirit within us. And I think that the Lord had a word that he wanted Simon to hear that morning. I think there was something in the sermon that, that Jesus wanted Simon to pay attention to because as soon as the sermon is over, Jesus basically tests to see if Simon was listening. He says, Simon, let's go out into the deep water and let's cast your nets again and let's see what happens when we fish together. And we can see that Simon's, you know, Simon's reflex is strong. It's still there. His, you know, his desire to just trust in his own wisdom and in his own ideas, his own experience over God's. The first thing he says is, Jesus, look, we worked all night. We didn't catch anything. And that's a hard, that can be a hard rhythm for us to break, can it? That, that, that desire to rely on what we think we know so well. And we can... We can come and we can worship and we can study and we can pray and we can soak up God's presence. But then as soon as that challenge to our faith comes, as soon as that invitation to, to follow God comes, as soon as Jesus walks into our life and says, now what you need to do is, well, then we can be tempted to say, now, wait a minute, God. Uh, what do you know about fishing? You know, what do you know about money? What do you know about parenting or relationships or the, the wonderful world of middle school? What do you know about any of that, God? You know, why don't you just leave me alone? This is none of your business. But thankfully, Simon, to use a, a fishing image, Simon catches himself. And Simon humbles himself. And Simon says, but because you say so, Lord, because you say so, I'll drop the nets. And so together, together they go out into the deep water. And together, Jesus shows Simon, helps Simon to discover an abundance of what he never would have found on his own. And I believe that Jesus is calling all of us. I think that Jesus is calling each and every one of us, wherever we're at in our, in our journey of faith, wherever we're at in our lives, I think that Jesus is always calling us to join him out in the deep water. Because ultimately, that's where the abundance is. And I'm not just talking about fish. God's abundant mercy waits for us in the deep water of the practice of forgiveness. And God's abundant peace waits for us out in the deep water of prayer and reflection. God's abundant joy waits for us out in the deep water of service to others. God's abundant love waits for us out in the deep water of deep relationships with him and, and with other people. And look, deep water, I know, is, is a risk. It's dark out there. You can't see the bottom. You can't see what's beneath the boat and it can be really hard to think about going there if you've just experienced failure in the shallow end. And so that's why deep water requires that we have a deeper trust in the one who knows what lies out there than we do in ourselves. Because if, if there ever was a know-it-all, in fact, know-it-all, it's Jesus, right? Right? And fortunately, Simon recognized in the presence of Jesus something more than just a, a local religious nut, but he sensed that this was someone worth listening to. And so when Jesus found Simon, in Simon's moment of failure, and Jesus came up to him and said, Simon, now what you need to do is you need to launch your boat out into the deep water and cast your nets again. Simon did. 
and there was the abundance of God's gifts out there in the deep water. And there was so much that it started to break the nets, and it started to spill over the edge of the boat, and it washed up to the shore, and it kept going and going and going until it covered the whole world, and that abundance that abundance is still there for us today, for those of us who will join Jesus when Jesus says, let's go out to the deep water and let's cast our nets. Let's pray together. Lord, as, as Doug mentioned earlier this morning, it's easy to trust you and, and to sing to you and to consider you a part of our lives when everything's going great and when all of our decisions seem to be the right ones and um, when our knowledge and, and our own wisdom seems to be carrying us towards success. But can we do the same, God, when we are in a moment of total failure, when we are in a moment of total emptiness, when all of our efforts and all of our work has left us with nothing. Can we hear you when you walk into our lives and say, now, what you need to do is this. God, we pray for humble hearts and open hearts to hear the word that you have for us, however it's spoken to us, to hear that word. And then, God, when you call us to go out into the deep water, the deep water of, of forgiveness or the deep water of generosity, the deep water of serving others, the deep water of humility that we would go there with you. Because we know, God, that's where the abundance of your gifts and your presence lies. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen.